Good morning, everybody. Uh, I introduce myself, the Dr. Aurélie Mayer, a uh, major in the French military health service, and I will present you my uh, PhD uh, research. In France, uh, cannabis uh, use uh, has, been, has decreased from uh, 2009, but uh, we observe to uh, an increase of other illicit drugs like cocaine. Thus, uh, we, we will try to answer that to this question. Is the cannabis a victim drug for subsequent food with other illicit drugs? We start, we have no conflict of interest, and uh, this research was only uh, financed with public funds. And I first in introduction, some elements of context. Adolescents and early adulthood are known to be a period of risky behavior, which include psychoactive substance use. One of the most known theories concerning drug use of process is the get theory, or GT, described by Kandai, according, which sequence, according to which the sequence of users could constitute an independent risk factor. This sequence starts uh, from illicit uh, drug use, tobacco and alcohol, and can lead to cannabis use, and further to use with other illicit drugs. However, this theory is a um, frequency question because substance use constitutes a complex phenomenon difficult to model. The existence of reverse sequences like cannabis use leading to tobacco use and the presence of confusing factors illustrate this complexity. <coughs> Multi-stage models are usually used in medical specialties. For example, in this uh, healthy ill death model, we study the transition from health to death, health to illness, for, for example, cancer, illness to death, and the subject can recover from this illness. The originality of our work is the use of a multi state model in medicology. Substance use process is here considered as a behavior similar to an illness. Thus, the aim of the study was the, the exploration of the gateway theory among adolescents and young adults. We studied the influence of cannabis use level on subsequent experiments with other illicit drugs. And we then described the influence of tobacco and alcohol use 
and transition from cannabis to OIV. Here is the method section, an alpha to population study. Data came from two French prevalent studies conducted in 2005. The ESCAPAT study was conducted among 17 year old, year old adolescents who participated to the National Defense Preparation Day, a compulsory day of military instruction. It concerns uh, boys and girls. Uh, the sample accounted for 5% of competition throughout the year, which gave 30,000 subjects. Data were collected using the self administration The protocol uh, of this study is uh, similar with those of uh, the ESPAT study in Europe, with uh, a bit older subjects. Uh, then, the Barometer Santé study is a telephonic survey which was conducted at a random, on a random sample of 30,000 subjects aged from 12 to 75. From collected data, we re reconstructed the retrospective cohort. For example, uh, we, uh, we studied uh, three events, age at cannabis initiation, age at uh, cannabis day use initiation, and age at experimentation <coughs> with OIG. For example, this given subject initiated cannabis at 13, initiated cannabis debut at 15, <coughs> and finally initiated with RIB at uh, 15. The model used was a homogeneous Markov multi-state model, which considered the transition between cannabis user scale stage from no use. from no use of, uh, to cannabis experiment and further to cannabis experiment from cannabis experiment to cannabis daily. And after the transition uh, to, towards OID experiment. Thus the model included six exclusive user states, no lifetime use, experiment of cannabis only, uh, experiment uh, of uh, OID only, Experiment of both cannabis and OID, and daily use of cannabis associated with experiment and OID. Seven transitions were allowed. Uh, the precedent blue model concerned only escapade data. For the barometer santé, age at cannabis daily use being, uh, was not collected. Thus, the corresponding model included only four states and four transitions from non and use to initiation of both cannabis and OIV. For each transition was estimated an intensity which represents the instantaneous risk of uh, transition. You can get further information about contract methodology in the corresponding paper. I will give uh, you the reference. The influence of covariates was estimated by the of hazard ratio. Tobacco use was scored as a free class categorical variable, no use, lifetime experiment without daily use, and daily use. Episode of drunkenness was scored as a binary variable, yes or no. I will now present the results and at first the population characteristic. The escapade population included near 30,000 17 years old adolescents. The participation rate was more than 90% and the gender ratio was 1. <coughs> the mean initiation age was around 15 for cannabis experiment and they use and 16 for experiment with IV. Tobacco initiation preceded cannabis initiation in 98% of cases and cannabis initiation preceded OID use in 81%. The age of the barometer santé population ranged from 12 to 75 this population had similar characteristics with those of escapade. Substance onset occurred here as a bit under age. Here are the use prevalence, uh, around 70% uh, uh, for escapade and 60% uh, for barometer. Uh, cannabis use uh, contact for uh, near 50% uh, of cases for the two studies. And the uh, experiment with IED I can test uh, for maybe uh, four on uh, five percent. <coughs> Here are presented the estimation of transition intensity for risk attack. 
this coefficient could be compared one with another by the wave intensity ratio. Thus, it appeared a significant 50 times greater risk for a non-lifetime user to initiate cannabis before oil. A gateway effect was also observed. Cannabis experiment being associated with a 20 times greater risk of subsequent OID experiment compared with a non-user. Moreover, a huge dose effect trend was observed, daily cannabis use being associated with a more than 100 times greater risk of subsequent OID experiment compared with a non-user. This risk was six times greater compared with cannabis experimental. On this slide are shown the estimation of hazard ratio associated with tobacco and alcohol use by the people <coughs> for each transition. Drunkenness experiment was only associated with cannabis experiment without influence on OID use. Tobacco use appeared also only associated with cannabis experiment without association with OID use. This risk increased with tobacco use level daily use being associated with a 2.2 times greater risk of experimenting cannabis. Also, risk was only 1.1 concerning tobacco experiments. Uh, the result was similar for the barometer santé population with a 37 times greater risk for a non-lifetime non user to initiate cannabis before oil. On the previously observed gateway effect, cannabis experiment was associated with a more than 100 greater risk of subsequent OID experiment compared with a non-user. In the same way, concerning the influence of tobacco and alcohol use, the drug dance experiment was only associated with cannabis experiment with a 0.4 uh, hazard ratio and tobacco use was also mainly associated with cannabis experiment with an increase of risk with tobacco use level, three times greater risk among experimenters and five times greater risk among tobacco daily users. Finally, on this slide is shown the comparison for risk capacity study between the prevalence observed uh, in the sample and prediction of the model. In red, for state one, no lifetime use, and state two, the cannabis experiment. You can see in the y-axis the prevalence function of frequent time, but the model was able to predict realistic transition with narrow confidence intervals. The results were similar for other states, and the prediction were also good for the barometer santé model. In blue, observed prevalence, and in red, right, the prediction of the model. Answer so, some element of discussion. At first, the result of our study showed that models fitted well the data, which is a likely consequence of a large sample size and were compatible with literature about GP. The sample size made possible the study of OID use, which is uh, relatively marginal. The main limit of our study is the retrospective <coughs> data, which leads to some imprecision due to the yearly measure intervals and the absence of measure of use decrease. For example, cannabis use evolving to less frequent use. Our results were in the line with the GT among adolescents and young adults. The first stage involved the transition from licit drug use to cannabis experiment with a dose effect trend concerning cannabis. The second stage concerned transitions from cannabis use to subsequent OID experiment with an increase of risk associated with cannabis level of use. Observed ratios we were held very high. Thus, the results were in accordance with the process leading from licit drug to OID experiment, cannabis acting here at the mediator. The theory which could emerge from this study could be called the string of opportunities theory. Lissed drugs, commonly available, are first used in a socializing complex of substances. Opportunity of using cannabis could be a likely consequence of peer influence and learning effect. For example, 
the common smoked wood of for tobacco and cannabis. Then, users will increase the cannabis use could need new source of supply that implies some contact with an illegal environment which predisposes to experiment with oil. However, the string of opportunities theory has its own limits. Some confounding factors, like individual or social characteristics, being susceptible to interact with substance use process. The hypothesis of a common factor for substance use was explored by some research. This factor uh, is likely to constitute an expression of genetic maturity. But uh, we cannot uh, study this one and uh, all the data. To conclude, our models are in line with actual knowledge about substance use process and get refugees which implies that prevention policies should focus on early stages of use among adolescents and young adults. However, some moderation is needed in the results. Some others think that GT could only be a social artifact. Moreover, the culture about substance use differs according to the countries, which implies the observation of different sequences. Finally, the common liability model is presently considered by some as a more accurate explanation of substance use process. Uh, you will find more information, particularly concerning the, the complex methodology, in the following reference. Uh, thank you for my attention. Thank you very much, Ori. Uh, questions? We have uh, ten minutes for questions. So, please. There is a microphone uh, that you can use for the questions. Yes, there's a question here. Uh, speaking as a, a statistician and uh, operational research analyst, I just want to say it's I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, some real uh, statistical data uh, with some confidence in uh, and a very good empirical fit. Um, I, I don't see a lot of work like this. Uh, anywhere in the East, it's, it's, it's a lot of um, I'm particularly interested in behavioural models um, for kind of behaviours which we're investigating. So the confounding factors that you can point to at the end, I think, are very important in terms of potential third variables that could explain both the new gameplay and the and the new use of tobacco. And it was to so I just want to ask, are you what's any plans to research that in a fully case? Thank you, the good question. Uh, this uh, research from RPG was only uh, was the, the beginning of uh, this area of research. The, the most important limit of, uh, of our work is uh, we choose a cross-sectional study. It is a experiment study like a star. And we have a very few data, uh, explicative data, uh, because uh, we are not sure that the data collected uh, at a given day uh, occurred before the substance use. I will, uh, I think I will uh, work, uh, I will use another, uh, another data uh, for the explore the common liability model and include some consulting texture uh, into the matrix type model. I think to the cohort of group in uh, Montreal, Canada. Uh, it, uh, it will be at the further research. Uh, we, um, we put uh, two variables uh, not presented here in our model, gender, and uh, girls were uh, less exposed to cannabis use, and uh, socio-economic uh, factor, and we uh, show, uh, show that uh, a lower uh, uh, higher, uh, higher economic class were more predisposed to cannabis initiation, experimentation, but uh, lower uh, social categories were, uh, were more at risk of daily use of uh, daily substance use. Any question down there? Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I come from Uganda and East Africa. 
Uh, one of the biggest problems we have now, apart from tobacco, I mean apart from alcohol, is more to do with the cannabis. But you find more young people smoking cannabis, not necessarily because they are smoking tobacco. Smoking cannabis independent of this ad. Of course, you find somehow a close relationship with alcohol. And we are so much interested in this because East Africa and Africa at large has a very big problem with cannabis use. Many smoking cannabis, especially young people. And many young people are taking it on and are picking it up. And uh, when you begin to study the, the, the factors, the risk factors and who is going to use, it becomes very interesting. And this is where you, you begin to touch us. Because apart from alcohol, now we see cannabis use increasing. And, and uh, I want to understand from you, in your study, you, when you studied the young people, the adolescents, did you have some mixed, mixed less? Because there are arguments that Africans can smoke more, or Africans are likely to use this, or white people like to use this. In your study, did you find those differences in terms of race, in terms of gender? Because not much work has been done in Africa to explain some of these factors very well. But from the you know, French side, what is, do you find about less? I know it's not a factor here, but to us, it's very important. But otherwise, thank you so much for your opinion. Uh, I will answer uh, by an, uh, another question to you. Uh, are the young people in your country uh, smoke cannabis only, uh, only marijuana or, uh, in the joint? Because, well, uh, you will see, I will, uh, I will do a presentation this afternoon concerning tobacco and cannabis uh, to parents. And uh, in France, uh, cannabis is often mixed with tobacco in, uh, into a joint. Uh, or, uh, it is uh, difficult to, uh, to study uh, the interaction uh, between the two substances. However, if we question an adolescent, uh, do you uh, smoke tobacco or do you smoke uh, cannabis? Smoke cannabis, uh, uh, when uh, an adolescent smokes cannabis, uh, also, he put tobacco in the joint, he will say, I uh, smoke cannabis. <coughs> and uh, the interaction, uh, it, is it is likely that the risk factors are different in Africa and in France, uh, considering that uh, model the consumption modalities are different. Yeah. Well, from Norway, uh, I'm very glad to be reminded of the, the Gekberg theory. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Governor Nahas introduced it, and Bob Dupont would get tough in the gateway bugs, and that was attacked by people that would like to liberalize. And I was just curious, how is this research received in France? Uh, well, for, for, for the moment, I don't know, because... Uh... <laughs> My thesis, uh, my, uh, my thesis is not, uh, I will uh, present uh, with uh, the system, but no, no impact in France for the moment. <coughs> but it is a frequently questioned theory. Uh, <laughs> I know. No more questions? Well, we're, we're, we're Wish you very good luck then, and hope that uh, the country will respond to, to these uh, questions. Because I, I understand that you have a quite a high prevalence of the cannabis use in France. Can I say uh, near the four experiment near the fifty percent, and uh, around uh, uh, fifteen percent of uh, regular use, at least uh, ten years of the month. We have such a big increase in uh, two thousand eight. And we wait for the escapade uh, 2011 like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're perfect on time. So uh, now uh, the second speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Richard Thurston, is also a colleague of mine.
and he is also a psychiatrist like myself, and uh, also an uh, addiction uh, specialist, uh, particularly working with children and adolescents. Uh, and he is uh, a social professor of, of psychiatry at the University of Colorado uh, Denver Health Science Center. So, uh, and he will be talking uh, about uh, yes, he will, he will be talking about the <coughs> medical marijuana and how it impacts uh, the, the use of uh, cannabis among young people. And this is, is I'm particularly interested in because I'm do, do, lecturing about medical marijuana uh, in Sweden and uh, informing Swedish. Uh, people who are uh, working with youngsters about this, because the young people in Sweden, they uh, use this as an argument. They find information about medical marijuana uh, on the internet, and uh, when they come to uh, a treatment center or to the school nurse or whoever discovers that they are taking uh, hashish or marijuana, uh, they uh, argue very much about this and use this as an argument to, to uh, uh, that, that it is okay, that it is something healthy, that it is used as medicine. And so uh, I'm very pleased that somebody has uh, is really investigated what happens with young people when you have this phenomenon of medical marijuana. So please, Dr. Foster. Thank you for the introduction. Mm -hmm. And I hope everybody can see the slides okay. So again, I'm Dr. Thurstone, and I'm a child psychiatrist and an addiction psychiatrist. And I run this adolescent substance abuse treatment program in Denver, Colorado, United States, and do part-time research, part-time clinical work. And in 2009, really started seeing uh, just an enormous number of my patients, teenagers, saying that they were using medical marijuana, diverted from other sources, and um, why would Dr. Person, why would I stop using marijuana? This is my medicine and it helps me with my ADHD and other problems. And that's when I started to look at this and become interested in this as a research subject. First, uh, I just want to point out here, this is my grandfather, who was a famous psychologist from Sweden. And um, so, I've never been to Sweden before. He was born, uh, Dr. Thunstrom changed his name to Thurstone, and that's how I got my name. Uh, he, he made it English sounding. So it's good to be back, and I hope that the research I do honors his legacy here as a psychologist. I want to acknowledge um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which funded this research and which funds about 80% of substance abuse research in the world. And so right here at the top, I was very impressed with uh, the rights of children and um, that state parties shall take all appropriate measures to protect children from the illicit use of narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances. And I thought that was an interesting juxtap juxtaposition with the advertisements that we have in Colorado for medical marijuana. This is for Summit Wellness, highest grade medicine in Colorado, including th over 35 strains, best edibles in town. And um, this is from a magazine that's available in any grocery store. It's a very nice, glossy magazine, beautiful pictures. Any adolescent child could pick this up for free in a grocery store and look at these. And they're certainly available online as well, these advertisements. So anybody in Sweden can look at these as well. And um, so who's being targeted with these advertisements? We're targeting young people with these advertisements, specifically probably young males, young adolescent, young adult males with our advertisements. <coughs> and here again, we have um, other advertisements to young people. We have here video game type of font. We have a cartoon character here, meant to appeal to young people again. Here we have, um, this is a medical marijuana dispensary right behind that plant. And on Saturdays, they offer free bike repair to adolescents and teenagers. And so in Sweden, it's different. Everybody rides their bike in Sweden. But in Denver, Colorado, you ride your bike if you're a teenager and you don't have your driver's license yet. Once you get your driver's license, there aren't too many adults riding their bikes around. And he's happy this, med this medical marijuana dispensary owner is happy to fix their bicycle. And so it's another way to market to young people. 
And so Colorado legalized medical marijuana in 2001, but in 2009 is when we really had um, a series of events that led to an explosion in medical marijuana use. We had a 2,000% increase in the number of medical marijuana patients in a single year. We went from about two to 5,000 patients, medical marijuana patients, every year to in 2009, by the end of the year, we had about 3.5 um, percent of the adult population in the state with a medical marijuana license. And about 25 percent of these uh, medical marijuana licensees were between the ages of 18 and 24. Seventy percent of them were male. And so I became very interested in what's the impact of this on young people. So here is um, a study <clears throat> that was done in Colorado and, and it, what it did was they went into the high schools in Adams County, it's a county just north of Denver, Colorado, where there are a lot of these medical marijuana dispensaries. And I was really interested, we're really interested in pre-post-2009, the uh, past month prevalence of marijuana use pre-post-2009. So on this y-axis here, you have percent. On this, you have years, so 2008, 2009, when we had this huge increase in medical marijuana use, and then 2010. And this is asking teenagers, did you use marijuana in the last month? Yes or no? So in 2008, 19% reported using marijuana in the past month. In 2009, it went to 22%. In 2010, it went to 30%. So, this increase here is rather large, three percentage points. Then again, eight percentage points increase right here. Typically, year to year in this survey, you might see an increase, decrease of 0.5 percent or so. I called the people who, the Adams County Youth Initiative that did this survey and asked, did anything change in your methods? And they assured me nothing changed in their confidential, anonymous, self-report questionnaire um, that they used. This here is uh, the Colorado Department of Education tracks school expulsions for drug use. And these are for any drug, but it's widely known the vast majority of these school expulsions are for marijuana use. So this is the number of school expulsions for drug use here. This is the school year here, 2008, 2009, 2009, 2010, 2010, 2011. And again, we're very interested in what happens right in 2009, when we had this very large increase in medical marijuana use. So right here in this year, there was a 40% increase in one year in the number of school expulsions for drug use. We were hoping that would be a one-year anomaly, uh, some exception to the rule. Unfortunately, if anything, it continued to go up uh, the following year. Now the biggest, the leading cause of death in the United States for the 15 to 20 year old age group is automobile accidents. And so this is, um, and it's, there's this myth out there that driving while intoxicated with marijuana is no big deal. And so we, do, we know it is a big deal and it does impair driving and um, increases one's risk for traffic fatalities. Um, so these are data put out by the Colorado Department of Transportation and on this y-axis, we have the number of drug recognition expert evaluations that were positive for marijuana. So currently, in the state, uh, the way that they judge if somebody has intoxicated driving with marijuana is that they go through a clinical exam with a drug recognition expert. And that's how it's determined that this person is driving under the influence. And so what's happening in terms of the number of positive evaluations um, by year. So this is the number of positive evaluations, and this is by year, year 2005 to 2010. Again, kind of interested in what's happening around this 2009 period. And we do see over the last five years or so, of almost doubling in the number of drug rec recognition expert evaluations that are positive for marijuana. So also concerning from the standpoint of children. Now these are, data, these are my data here that we've collected. I'm going to present to you four studies that we've done here in our research group. And I was very, so teen marijuana use is, uh, some of the active ingredients of it are thought to be availability of the substance, 
the perceived harmfulness of the substance, and the social norms, how acceptable it is. And so I was trying to get at um, the impact that knowing somebody with a medical marijuana license or having obtained marijuana from somebody with a marijuana license would have on these teenagers. And it's cross-sectional data, so we can't make causal inferences, but we can at least get associations and um, that suggest the need or not the need for further research. So this is um, 80 teenagers, ages 15 to 19 years old, in substance treatment at my clinic. This is outpatient substance treatment. And we ask them, do you know anyone with a medical marijuana license? Yes or no? Okay, so it, just over 80% reported yes, they knew somebody with a medical marijuana license. And about 20% reported they didn't. We also asked them, have you ever obtained marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license? And about 49% said yes, and 51% no. So about half and half in terms of reporting that they had obtained marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license. Now let me walk you through this graph here. Right here is the column, ever obtaining marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license. And this is never obtaining um, marijuana from someone with a marijuana license here. Right. And we asked them um, questions about um, is there, how easy, how accessible is marijuana to you? And we compared the percent reporting very easy access um, in the two categories here. And you see that those ever obtaining marijuana from somebody with a medical marijuana license, 85% reported very easy marijuana access compared about 44%, and that was statistically significant difference. We asked them about their friends' disapproval of regular marijuana use. So among those ever obtaining marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license, about 80% reported their friends don't disapprove of regular marijuana use, compared to about 56% here. Again, statistically significant. Then we asked them in terms of the frequency of their marijuana use, comparing ever obtaining marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license and never obtaining. 84% reported using more than 20 times on average per month in the last year versus 56% here, again statistically significant. We also administered to them the Drug Use Screening Inventory Revised, which asks about problems related to substance use and just general life problems. And this is rated on a scale from 0 to 100, 0 being no problems, 100 being maximum problems. And we see that those ever obtaining marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license had an average score of 46 compared to about 31. That was statistically significant. And in terms of overall life problems, 46 versus 37. So at least consistent, again, cross-sectional data, can't make any causal inferences, but at least consistent with the hypothesis that maybe this medical marijuana is having an impact on the availability, social norms of um, teens and marijuana use. So those are teenagers and substance treatment. What about kind of regular kids. So this is a sample of 60 teenagers, 15 to 19 years of age, presenting to a primary care clinic. So these are teenagers who are going to their pediatrician to, for a cold, for birth control, for a sports physical, for something else, okay? Just general, they're not in substance treatment. And we ask them the same questions. Do you know anyone with a medical marijuana license? 33% reported yes, and 67% reported no. Have you ever obtained marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license? 25% reported yes, and 75% reported no. So still we have about one in four teenagers presenting to a primary care appointment saying, yes, I've used somebody else's medical marijuana before in my life. And so we did a similar thing, and let me walk you through it here. We compared those knowing someone with a medical marijuana license, those not knowing someone with a medical marijuana license. And we split it up this way, too, because from the story of tobacco, we know that 
knowing a smoker, having a smoker in your household, has a very important impact on whether or not that teenager will then go on to use tobacco. So here we are, comparing knowing versus not knowing. And if you know somebody, you reported 60% said very easy access to marijuana, compared to 28% if you didn't know someone with a medical marijuana license. Statistically significant. Friends don't disapprove of regular marijuana use. 28% um, versus, uh, looks like that's a mistake here. That was about, actually it was about 18% and that was statistically significant. No past year marijuana use, okay? 20% reported no past year marijuana use versus 60% if you didn't know someone with a medical marijuana license. Again, statistically significant. And again, this is this drug use screening inventory revised, measures problems on a scale of zero to 100, 100 is maximum problems. When it comes to problems related to substance use, if you knew somebody with a medical marijuana license, the average score was 41 compared to 26. A trend, the p-value was um, 0.054, so a trend toward that being uh, significant. And similarly here, overall life problems, 39 to 24. Again, a trend for that being significant. So again, consistent with the idea that knowing someone with a medical marijuana license might have an impact on your perceived availability and social norms of, um, mar around mar the frequency of marijuana use. All right, so this is another study that we did here of 164 teenagers in a different substance treatment program. So who knows, maybe there, were, there was something about the teenagers in my substance treatment program that doesn't, they don't, for whatever reason, doesn't generalize to other teenagers in substance treatment. So this was a substance treatment program across town. And we asked them, um, have you ever, we worded the question a little differently, have you ever used someone else's me medical marijuana? So technically, um, it could be your medical marijuana that you gave to him and then gave to me which is a little bit more flexible than the way I worded it in the previous study. Have you ever used somebody, have you ever obtained marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license directly? Okay. So 74% of the, these teenagers in this sample reported, yes, I have used uh, medical marijuana, someone else's medical marijuana in the past. And the average number of times that among those who had used someone else's medical marijuana, the average number of times they had used that medical marijuana was 50 times in their life. Um, and when we compared those who had used someone else's medical marijuana versus not used someone else's medical marijuana, they were more likely to be male. And from the advertising I showed you, maybe that's no big surprise. More likely to be Hispanic Latino, 32% versus 26%, which is interesting in terms of many of the medical marijuana dispensaries are in a part of town where a lot of Hispanic Latinos live, and so it's an interesting question of the impact that this may have, especially on um, immigrant populations, underrepresented minorities. Um, we also compare the number of days used marijuana in the past six months. And those who had used someone else's medical marijuana had 103 days of marijuana use in the last six months, compared to about 82 days, statistically significant. And we also compared the number of marijuana use disorder symptoms. So people can have this clinical diagnosis of marijuana abuse or dependence, symptoms being such as like tolerance to the drug, withdrawal from the drug when they stop taking it, Unsuccessful, unsuccessful efforts to cut down, using more than intended. So we summed up the number of marijuana dependent symptoms and found that there was a statistically significant difference with those using someone else's medical marijuana reporting more marijuana use disorder symptoms on average than those who didn't. So again, concerning data there. And then finally, the last study I wanted to share with you, just aspects of it. We surveyed 137 adults 
in substance treatment in Denver, Colorado, where there's a lot of medical marijuana dispensaries and users. And we asked them a series of questions, multiple questions, but three that I wanted to share with you today in the time we have. Uh, we asked them, is marijuana safe for children less than 13 years of age? And uh, almost 12% said yes, or they were unsure. Is marijuana safe for teenagers 13 to 18 years of age? And about 38% said yes, or they were unsure. And is marijuana safe for pregnant women? And this has been a big problem actually in Denver, Colorado, in terms of women using, um, getting medical marijuana for uh, first trimester nausea. Um, it's been written a lot about in the press. So 28% uh, reporting, um, yes, marijuana was safe in pregnancy or they were not sure. So in terms of conclusions here, I have the conclusions that kind of come from my data and then I have some of kind of my own opinions here that are kind of my constructive, my, my opinions in terms of how we can fix this. But um, certainly we're documenting, we're clearly documenting in substance abuse samples and general samples of adolescents pretty widespread access and diversion of medical marijuana to youth. The next stage of the science will be to find out exactly how are youth accessing this medical marijuana. Is it through the back door of a dispensary? Is it from a friend? Is it from a family member? Is it from a dealer who just got his license so then he can just sell it? We don't know, and that's the next stage of the science that we need to find out if we're going to try to cut this pipeline off at all. We certainly need more education about the risks of child and adolescent exposure to marijuana. The last slide showed that in terms of the number of people thinking it's safe or not sure whether or not it's safe for children or people in pregnancy. And certainly in terms of the, the previous data I showed in terms of the social norms being so positive about marijuana use among these teenagers. And really, in um, in Colorado, I feel like we've had de facto legalization of marijuana. So any of us could go to, a, there are about 15 doctors who write about 80% of the recommendations for marijuana in the state. And as long as we have about $100, which I guess 600 kroner or so, we could go in and pay this doctor to write us a recommendation for marijuana. So we have a de facto legalization of marijuana in our state. And it's been associated with an increase um, of apparent increase in prevalence of adolescent substance use by a lot, increase in the number of school expulsions for drug use, um, and an increase in the number of not just um, it was I showed you the number of drug recognition expert evaluations that were positive for marijuana, so an increase in driving under the influence. So I think that legalization in our states associated with an increase in adolescent use and problems related to that use. So following a little looser from my data and you know, my own opinions here, I think that um, what we had in Colorado from 2001 to 2008 was a caregiver model. So I could designate somebody, one person, to grow marijuana for me, or I could grow it myself. We didn't have these large stores that had thousands of patients and that um, sold marijuana like that. We didn't have large stores that had the advertising I showed you and the marketing. And we didn't have these large stores and dispensaries that, according to the Denver Post, our local newspaper, make $10,000 a day. And that then put that into the political process and can manipulate the political process. And, for example, we um, were trying to pass a per se limit for intoxicated driving, meaning a blood level of THC that would constitute impaired driving in our state. There was very heavy lobbying against that. We failed the second year in a row, despite the data I showed you from the Colorado Department of Transportation, to be able to pass that per se limit. So I think the best we could do, if you're going to have medical marijuana in your state, in your country, in your city, is to have a caregiver model. I think that minimizes the risks to teenagers. Um, it's my own personal opinion, though, that you know there are risks and benefits to everything, that, and medicine is all about risks and benefits. And certainly, there's um, the compassionate use of marijuana for people who are truly in end stage um, 
uh, disease, but then there's the thousands of teenagers who then have easier access to it and whose lives get run off track. And so it's risks and benefits. And I feel like in Colorado, our experiment with medical marijuana, the risks, in my opinion, have outweighed the benefits. And then, in terms of we've seen what happens in Colorado, it's been a nice time to be a researcher in the state, in a way, because we have seen what's the impact of legalizing marijuana on teenagers. And um, the preliminary data certainly don't look good. So we're voting in the state to legalize marijuana, yes, no, in November of this year. And I think the data, at least in my opinion, the way I read them, would not support doing that if, if it's from the perspective of what's good for children and, and adolescents. And so with that, I think I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I, I would uh, take the privilege to ask one question. What, what's the time, uh, what, what's the age limit for uh, medical marijuana in Colorado? Right. So the question is, what's the age limit for medical marijuana in Colorado? And technically it's 18. So if you're un there are about 40 um, people, minors, under the age of 18 with a medical marijuana license in the state. To do that, you technically need to have a notarized, witnessed signature of both your parents in order to get that medical marijuana license. Um, so the marijuana use, medical marijuana use I'm talking about in the teenagers mostly is diversion of it because um, you can be 18 and still be in high school and have a lot of buddies who, friends who are 15 years old still. And so um, I think that's where the big problem lies. Um, if, if it's possible, we push to have the age limit for medical marijuana be 21 because we thought socially that would remove them a little bit further from a 15-year-old. And we know from the previous presentation, early onset of marijuana use is not, does carry the bad prognosis. Um, but we failed to do that. The dispensaries are very, have a very powerful lobby right now. Um, one quick comment about that too, it's very common in treatment now for me to come across um, parents who tell their children, hey, if you're going to use marijuana, just let me know about it so I can go get you a medical marijuana license so you won't get in trouble. We're hearing that all the time now. It's, it sends a message to their teenagers. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw this hand here and then I saw that one, so we'll go here and again. Thanks, Kathy Angel, um, How much diversion is there from parents' medical marijuana to their children? Right, the because question. Because here in the UK we have quite significantly socially fathers smoking with sons from quite right. a young age. Right. Uh, so, once you have medical marijuana, I just wonder if that exacerbated that type of social problem that already exists possible. Right. So, the question is an excellent one. How much of this? medical marijuana diversion is from parents to kids. I think that's exactly the next study that we need to do because we know there's widespread diversion to kids, but we don't know. Is it mostly friends? Is it mostly family? Is it mostly something else? We know from the story of prescription drug abuse that friends and family are the way that teenagers get a hold of prescription medications and abuse them. With medical marijuana, we don't know yet. and. Um, with the study we did, um, and in terms of the Institutional Review Board ethics approval that we got, um, we were not actually allowed to really explore that, um, because then we'd also have to report it to social services and the authorities as potential child abuse. So, but that is our next study, and it's a great question. Can I just ask one follow-up yeah. to on your ethical review boards, would the people on ethical review boards be allowed to be medical marijuana users? Or would their judgment be deemed impaired for making an ethical judgment about other people? Right. Is the, so the question is an excellent one. Would the institutional review boards that review the ethics of it be allowed to, would people on that board be allowed to be medical marijuana users? And the answer is yes. There's nothing that would prohibit that. Good question. And then there's one here. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Suthal with Katka. I was one wondering if your slides are available and two would like permission to share them 
with our colleagues in Massachusetts and New York and other states that are actually facing these issues right now. Massachusetts is whether they can open dispensaries and New York is medical marijuana. Because I think that what you found would be extremely instructive for them to go to legislators and to the press and other people with. So I just was wondering, one, if it could be used, and two, do we have your permission to do yes. that? So that's a great question. So the answer is yes. I'm free. I'm very happy to share a PDF of my slides around. And um, so here's, in fact, you remind me too, this is my website here, drthurstone.com. And speaking of education about the risks of marijuana use, with the Colorado Department of Education was very concerned, hey, we have a 40% increase in the number of school expulsions for basically marijuana use. Um, we need to get good information out there from teens and parents about the risks of marijuana use. And so this is, those are on, on that website there are some really nice materials that we did that are updated that talk about the risks of adolescent exposure to marijuana use. And, um, and through there you can also get a hold of me, feel free to email me any other questions, comments, concerns. And I can send a um, PDF of the slides, and I think a PDF of the slides will is supposed to be available on the website for the Third World Forum. So um, they asked me for my slides, and I'm happy to give them. And um, yes, in terms of Massachusetts, my recommendation, if there's anything to learn from the Colorado mistake, is not to do dispensaries. It seems that's when we had the explosion of. It seems like the diversion of marijuana use among kids and the target, the specific targeting of kids, it really reminds us of the story of tobacco and 70 years of pushing back on tobacco. No, we're not advertising to kids. No, it's not addictive. And, and then it turns out it's all not true. And it's kind of like we're repeating that same mistake again. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank yeah. you. And there's a question in the back here. Yes, sir. Um, thank you so much. I, I've been reflecting on your presentation and putting it in the context of this Congress, of this conference which we are having. And I'm particularly looking at the proponents, the people who support marijuana, and the arguments they advance. And these are, tend to be so attractive. One of them is that, like, you know, giving the, uh, the African perspective and coming from Africa at the same time, is that they are saying that if you smoke marijuana, if you take marijuana, marijuana will help you in dealing with HIV AIDS problem. Right. They, they are also saying now, we, we, we hear people saying that actually marijuana is, is, is not so harmful like tobacco. <laughs> tobacco is far dangerous than marijuana. And those are the arguments which they tend to concentrate on. There are many others which they, 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 you know, they, they put forward and they are trying to convince young people, they are trying to convince people to take drugs. And these sometimes are posted on very big networks, networks which are served with so many people. Like yesterday, I, I, I visited my, my network where we have over 100 people who are served on the network. And somebody was promoting that uh, marijuana use that was so happy that somebody took marijuana and was able to treat cancer. And somebody responded, this is the best news I've ever had. And this is how they advance. This does not come out, but coming from the medical point of view, what, what are your you know, quick comments on this? And how do we counteract this if we are we are going for the World Federation uh, concept and the, and the message? <coughs> so I think I'll just repeat the question, make sure I got it right. But basically, the, please, to comment on the medical aspect, the medical uses of marijuana, especially as it relates to HIV and other things. And uh, so I'd like to point to the Institute of Medicine report in 1999 that came out. It's available online. Anybody can download it. Google search Institute of Medicine, Medical Marijuana, and up will come the report that anybody can look at. But basically, the bottom line of that report, which convened world experts in marijuana and medical marijuana, and their conclusion was to allow for compassionate use of marijuana for people who are not expected to live more than about six months or so. And, um, and their other conclusion was to that studies of smoked marijuana are not um, indicated to mean that we should then prescribe and recommend smoked marijuana. 
but rather to um, tell or not we should look at the ingredients of marijuana and see what might be therapeutic within the ingredients of marijuana smoke. So I think that, um, um, let's see here. So what do I think? I think that, I, that there is this compassionate use concept and I think that everything in medicine is risk benefit and you have to weigh the risk and benefit of letting a few people use it compassionately versus um, what's going to happen if you have medical marijuana and how many youth are going to use it and how many more accidents you're going to have and dropouts and teen pregnancies and psychosis and related to that, right? So I think people have to weigh that carefully. I think in terms of um, the ingredients of marijuana have been studied uh, for in terms of HIV and improving appetite related to HIV. And I will say that those studies were done before um, heart therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy. So my colleagues in infectious disease medicine are telling me that there really isn't, in the, now with heart therapy, medication therapy for HIV, there really isn't the need anymore for marijuana to increase people's appetite. Um, and then I think another thing um, to think about in the story of Colorado is that 94% of the recommendations for medical marijuana are for pain. Um, about 1-3% to are for cancer and 1-3% for HIV. So it's actually very much the exception to the rule that people are getting medical marijuana for cancer or for HIV. It's the vast majority of reporting pain is their qualifying condition. There are seven qualifying conditions in Colorado for this. Um, having said that, in terms of studying the history of this in Colorado, um, the medical marijuana legislation was um, supported initially by groups that are known to have their ultimate purpose be full legalization of marijuana. So it's my opinion that yes, there were people from the beginning who sincerely thought that this is medicine, but the real backers, most of the backers and money behind it in 2000 when it was voted on, were really their end goal was to legalize it outright. But just to get their foot in the door with the medical system and then now that we have this, really it's a mess in Colorado. We have 3% of our population, adult population with a medical marijuana license. They're saying, well, the toothpaste is out of the tube, the horse is out of the barn, so we need to just legalize it now. And it's an effective argument they're using. And I would counter that with, if we could just not legalize it this year, we can go back and maybe get rid of the dispensaries and go back to a pure caregiver model that will really reduce the harm of um, the harm to adolescents and also maybe people you know who truly could use it compassionately will still have access to it. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, uh, I and think then I think we, we'll, we'll have to... Uh, I'm getting yanked uh, off the stage here, but thank so you. We have one more speaker to go, but this is so interesting. <laughs> okay, we can talk I'll be around later and we can talk more. Thank you very thank you much. Time. Today, uh, Michel Perron, uh, who is uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Centre of Substance Abuse in Canada, and who also has, uh, sorry, uh, he also has an important position uh, because he is the chair of the Vienna uh, NGO Committee, uh, that is the link between the NGOs and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. So, uh, We're almost there. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, he's at least, uh, anyway, he's going to talk about uh, cannabis, uh, the cannabis situation in, uh, yes, the cannabis situation in Canada. Very good. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and panelists and colleagues here. Um, thank you, first of all, to the World Pharma 
drugs and the World Federation Against Drugs for the invitation to be here. I'd like to acknowledge the, the work of Donald Carlson, the president, the board, and the government of Sweden who has supported this event for three years now, or three times. I think it's important that uh, as we move along, and you know, a little bit from my role at the, the UN, is that, uh, that uh, this voice be heard very clearly and, and very consistently in terms of what is happening with the policy. As many of you know, and as colleagues in the audience, uh, the issue of legalization, decriminalization continues to be very much at the top of the political agenda. Uh, there is a lot of apparent confusion as to what to do, and I think it rests with uh, individuals and experts such as those in the room here, among others, to find some way forward. Um, so today, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you. I'll make an apology to the statistician in the front here. Uh, I'm not a statistician, I'm not a researcher. Uh, I'm just the CEO. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Center on Substance Abuse. I have an opportunity today to present the work of my colleagues uh, who are much more akin to your, uh, to your profession and speak about the situation in Canada with respect to cannabis. Uh, and I, I must admit, I think it's a fitting sort of third part of the stool here in terms of the research presented from France, our colleagues in Colorado, and what we're seeing here in Canada. So, um, a little bit about the organization that I work for. Um, the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse is a bit of an odd organization. We were created by a federal act of parliament as a national non-governmental organization. In other words, we are of government, but not in government. And my responsibility is to bring together all the orders of government, all levels of government, we have many in Canada, from federal, provincial, territorial, regional, municipal, the not-for-profit sector and the private sector to work together to find ways to reduce alcohol and drug related harm. Um, we do so with a fairly small staff. Ours is primarily a research staff, a knowledge exchange staff, and a partnership-based uh, staff of creating and uh, being a catalyst to dealing with this issue from a pan-Canadian approach. In other words, getting everybody sort of swimming the same way towards common objective, despite the diversity of the issues in our field. The, uh, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, symbols to the right, that is an Anukshuk brought from our Inuit people, which are the northern people. And these are stones that they would place in a certain way when you walk up in the north, which is probably the same as north in Sweden here, where there is only snow. It's kind of hard to trail, mark your trail. These Anukshuks are ways by which our Indian people would mark their trails and is often symbolized as a way of trying to mark a trail as we move forward in our own work. Uh, just to give some of you a uh, perspective in terms of the CC of uh, Canada, sorry, uh, for those of you who have not necessarily had the chance to be there, uh, it's a fairly large country, uh, but very small in way of population compared to our neighbors immediately to the south. Uh, 33 million, two official languages, French and English, 9.9 uh, .9 million square kilometers, six time zones. Uh, it, it takes a while to get across our country. Um, our Aboriginal roots, which are First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, account for 4% of our population. But as you've seen in other countries, uh, there is a significant amount of problems with those uh, the populations. And, and our care in terms of dealing with them is, is more specialized. And we have the longest undefended border in the world uh, with our colleagues in the United States at 9,000 kilometers. or 5,400 miles, if you want to call it, from the imperial system. Uh, just to give you a sense of the truth, of this, uh, yeah. Uh, up here is White Horse, uh, which is in Western Canada, and that is on the same latitude as Stockholm. So you get a sense of where we are in the country, and uh, I will be going there in a week. It takes five hours to fly to across the country, and then three hours up. So uh, you can imagine the diversity of people, the challenge that we face with respect to alcohol and drug issues, and how we try to move the issue along. So let's get into cannabis more specifically. Uh, I'll speak to you today about the legal status of cannabis in Canada, the context and environment, uh, cannabis and driving, which was alluded to by Dr. Thurston, um, the response and the way forward in trying to bring in the notion that was asked of us, which is, is it more or less? Uh, it might be a surprise to some people, but cannabis is in fact illegal in Canada. Um, I say a surprise because there is such a, as we say in French, banalisation, a certain laissez-faire approach or view towards cannabis that some people are truly surprised that it is illegal. Uh, but in fact it is. Possession under 30 grams, which is one ounce in the imperial system, uh, can still result in a summary conviction. And <coughs> imprisonment, uh, possession of 30 grams or further or more is seven uh, years, up to the years, I'm oh, sorry, uh, imprisonment up to seven years, uh, and then some offenses and so on and so forth. 
And the challenge, however, is that despite the fact that it is illegal, there are very few instances in which there are charges laid solely for the possession of cannabis. So we have the system which is in place, but not necessarily applied, which I think reinforces the notion that it might not be illegal in of itself. And that is a challenge I think that we've seen in many countries is that uh, how is it you reconcile and you try and inform? And I have two children, my daughter's 20, uh, 19, going on 25, and my son is 17, going on 8. And uh, it's very challenging to deal with my teenagers in the environment in which they, they live and they go to school. And I see firsthand that I come home and they quickly take off my hat of CEO of the Canadian Center on Substance Abuse, and I'm all of a sudden a parent faced with the same challenges that you are and that people you try and work with. We also have been picking up into the notion of uh, medical marijuana. Because of the way our, our courts are structured, there was an appeal made that uh, access to cannabis should be permitted for constitutional reasons and that to not be able to access it for medical purposes was an infringement on, on our constitutional rights. The courts agreed with that and therefore we had this scheme put in place around medical marijuana which has resulted in a considerable amount of confusion again. In other words, is cannabis good for you or not? We have courts leading the delivery of a system for health care and it is very much separate to our existing public health care system in Canada, which again has exacerbated the situation. I think the situation in Colorado is probably more acute in terms of the commercialization, the advertising that we see, but certainly in Canada we have over 13, uh, close to 13,000 Canadians who are authorized for medical marijuana, uh, that is to grow and possess. They can designate somebody to grow for them, so I can have Calvina grow for me, and Calvina can grow for somebody else. And then you have the police who breaks down the door and all of a sudden Calvina pulls out some certificate and says, no, I'm okay. And then they say, okay, where does that go? I mean, it causes all sorts of difficulties for the police. And at the end of the day, um, I think it converts, if I can use that term, the sanctity of what are we trying to uh, allow for use as medicine in our country. And the same situation applies with prescription drug abuse uh, in terms of the diversion aspect and some of the challenges we, we face there. What up? Uh, the cannabis context and environment is not surprising as it is globally. It is the most widely consumed illicit drug in Canada and especially among young Canadians, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, recent polling, again not surprising, uh, suggests that a majority of Canadians support legalization or decriminalization. As most of you are, who are experts here in this room know, there is a vast difference between the two. And secondly, the vast majority of people who respond to these questions are simply responding it, it, without an informed opinion, and yet the numbers are used to rationalize and support positions which we know are not, are not useful for, for us as a country. We have a, that picture up at the top is marijuana grow operations. Because we have a cold climate, we have adapted very well and learned how to grow pot indoors. And uh, we have done so with tremendous success. Uh, I'm saying this uh, cheeky uh, and historically, um, where we are now exporting cannabis to the United States. The quality of our cannabis is such that one pound of our cannabis will be, uh, be exchanged for one pound of cocaine in the United States. Um, we have a significant marijuana rural operation criminal gang problem with respect to these interior uh, grows, and uh, it is posing some significant challenges for enforcement authorities. Literally thousands of internal grow operations across the country accessing them, uh, finding the resources, applying the enforcement is very labor intensive and again we have this notion of a huge supply sitting there. Uh, finally, it's often cited as a, the number one or number two reason for seeking uh, treatment, alcohol being the number one drug used by uh, Canadians. I should, the point of the picture at the bottom here um, is on 420 day, which uh, thank you to our colleagues from the America who uh, instigated, well not intentionally I'm sure, uh, 420. 420 is a global type of movement celebrating on April 20th uh, cannabis uh, for illicit purposes. And, and regretfully, uh, there you have our parliament building, our federal parliament building. You have about four or 5,000 people who show up for the 420 smoke-in. And at 420 in the afternoon, they all light up uh, pot. Um, and that's the haze that you see there. There's no smog typically in Canada. The problem, however, is uh, what if we had 5,000 young people go and drink alcohol underage on Parliament Hill? I think the reaction would be a bit different in terms of the society, and yet we allow this to occur as it occurs in cities around the world. And I think it speaks to the broader environment in which we're trying 
to deal with the issue of prevention and understanding and impact. Um, and it's very significant for the people we work with. For myself, I get very upset uh, as a parent and as a professional that we have police officers that have to stand by and witness this. Uh, they cannot arrest 5,000 people, and in fact, it would simply play into the media that many people would like to see. Uh, conversely, there is no consequence. And many of these people would like to get in a car and drive home. And I'll speak to the, more, the issue of drugs and driving, uh, which is equally of concern to us. Well, prevalence, if, I, if I've not painted a happy enough picture for you now, uh, the prevalence of cannabis use in Canada, there is some good news, are uh, the general population surveys. Uh, we're seeing a general and gentle reduction uh, of marginally lower uh, past year use of 10.7% uh, of our Canadians 15 years and older from 11.4. So it's, it's fairly uh, stable at that level. Uh, cannabis among youth, uh, not surprisingly much higher. Uh, we're seeing that there is a bit of a decrease, uh, but in 2010, 25% of those youth aged 50 to 24 uh, are using cannabis uh, on a uh, past year basis. In addition, 1 in 20 youth are reporting cannabis use on a daily or almost daily basis. Uh, so there is a, not unlike presented by our colleagues from France and in the United States, a significant cohort of youth who are using cannabis uh, on a regular basis. Uh, to try and put this into some uh, European perspective, and I apologize for the small font, uh, but the SPAD study is located here at the bottom, and you'll show our 25% of Canadian youth uh, I'm going to use the pointer here, I'm not used to doing these things. But 25% uh, uh, is where we're sitting, this is the Czech Republic. Of course, Sweden is always uh, very low and, and we look to Sweden and say, what is the secret sauce in Sweden? Why is it like this? Um, that said, 21% uh, of is used uh, 15 to 34. These are the cutoffs that are being used similarly uh, to the uh, SPAD studies in Spain. And then 10.7 of all Canadian adults coming in around this level. So there's no question it shows that from a Canadian perspective, we are among the higher, uh, the pun intended, uh, use countries uh, compared to some of our European colleagues. Uh, cannabis use and driving, it is a significant issue in Canada. Uh, some of our research, Dr. Uh, uh, Beerness, uh, has led some international research and we actually collaborated with the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction to get a sense of what exactly is this issue of cannabis and driving. Uh, we did a roadside survey, which does not result in an arrest, but actually a, a drive home after in terms of these anonymous uh, report of use. 8.5% uh, tested positive for drugs, cannabis being the most common occurrence. Uh, among senior high school students, one in five reported driving within an hour of using cannabis. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the American Cheech and Chong, it is the sort of the, the, the parody of smoking cannabis and, and sitting at the curb and being very cautious when in fact we know that cannabis use impairs reaction times, uh, contributes to traffic uh, crashes and fatalities in a significant way. And this is another aspect that we need to bring forward to, to people to understand. Um, males more likely than females, no surprise there, one in three having been a passenger. Uh, attitudes towards drinking and uh, uh, sort of driving following cannabis use. 8% uh, of people have done that. And they consider it safe or very safe. Um, this is very different than you see drinking and driving. So I think we should remember the drinking and driving successes that we've occurred, uh, achieved in, in our respective countries and see how that brings into uh, this, this, this issue. We also did a uh, study of fatally injured, fatally injured drivers. Uh, from 2000 to 2007, where 47% of those drivers, uh, 19 years or younger, died in a motor crash and used alcohol or drugs, cannabis being the most uh, common psychoactive substance found. So it is not a benign substance if you're driving. It is not without risk. It is, in fact, very evidently with risk. Our role um, in Canada's anti-drug strategy, the federal government of Canada has launched a very significant <coughs> strategy in terms of preventing, treating, and addressing drug abuse. Uh, the federal government uh, activities complement those of the provinces. In Canada, our provinces are responsible for the delivery of health care services. So it's really, we work with the federal government and the, and the provinces. Um, we were tasked with coming up with a national youth drug prevention strategy, and we came up with three particular aspects. One is national standards for youth drug prevention programs in schools, families, and communities. 
essentially the government came to us and, and said initially, you want to create the new DARE program, which is the program of uses resistance education, You're familiar with it likely. And I said, no, I'd rather not go and compete with other programs, but rather create the bar against which all prevention programs should be measured, standards, if that makes sense. And that's what we've actually done, is create these standards. We're working with CCAD, the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, as well as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, in terms of applying these standards in schools. In other words, no drug prevention program can be delivered in a school that does not meet the standards that we have identified nationally. And when I say we, it's not necessarily just CCSA, but our partners as well. Uh, we've also undertaken some online resources and something specific to cannabis, which I'll get into. So these are the standards. These standards are available for anybody who wishes to look at them. They are not meant to be the highest threshold of prevention standards, but at least at a minimum, do no harm, use this, and then mature from there. Uh, and they have been met with significant uh, uh, positive reaction from teachers, practitioners, and the like. Often we would talk to teachers, and they say, well, we're going to do a prevention program, and my brother-in-law works for the RCMP, so I asked them for a program. And, and you get all these mix of different pro prevention programs in the schools, and you don't really understand or know if they're based on, on good evidence or not. So we also have the standards for uh, school and uh, family and community-based. In other words, community-based, many of our youth, so if they get the same message in the school as they do in community, as they do with their family, we have this triangulation of understanding that people get the same understanding of the issue. We've undertaken a, a, some online resources. Uh, this is called experiment.ca, which was a way by which we tried to attract young people to come and experiment and understand the effects of drugs online. Uh, they would subject our friendly uh, eyeball Earl uh, to the drugs and get a sense of how it is that it interacts with them. What we've done is create a, por a portal around which people who work in the field of prevention can now access these resources and contribute to them. I don't know how many posters are probably done every year on cannabis across Canada, across Canada, and yet everybody puts effort, resources, and time into creating new posters. We have a series of posters available made by our partners. We now make these available across the country free of charge. So the, the point is really leveraging the existing investments in the field of prevention. We've also undertaken uh, five publications specific to clearing the smoke on cannabis. And this is around the issue, the most recent one, number five here, which we released was on the issue of um, cannabis for, for therapeutic purposes, which really <coughs> resulted in, in very much with our Thurston landed as well, that there might be some applicability for smoke cannabis in end of life care, but uh, the specific uh, therapeutic benefits of cannabinoids contained within cannabis itself, and uh, we should uh, encourage additional research to have a safer delivery mechanism for these cannabinoids within a dose-controlled uh, mechanism for specific uh, illnesses. Again, we do not want to change our existing pharmaceutical uh, approval process simply to accommodate cannabis, which is often brought in for a different purpose altogether. Um, each of these uh, publications was delivered to professionals. It talks about cannabis and, and mental health issues, the issue of brain development, and so on and so forth. Again, trying to, again, clear the smoke on cannabis because, as we know, there is a fair amount of confusion. Uh, we've also undertaken some specific activities on cannabis and driving, held some national webinars with our colleagues from uh, Motor Vehicle Transport Safety, Police, Public Health, uh, uh, and uh, many of the student groups that work on drinking and driving and now getting involved in drugs and driving. So to sum up, some of the challenges and achievements. Uh, there's no question that reducing the prevalence of cannabis use is an ongoing effort. It's trending the right way. Uh, you know, it's always hard to tell exactly what was the, the true cause to that downward trend. Uh, but certainly, we know it's an ongoing effort. We are very concerned by the cannabis use that's daily or almost daily. Uh, concerned about cannabis use and driving. Very concerned about the organized crime role with respect to commercial production and export of cannabis. Um, I'm concerned, and my organization is, in terms of the public and political views concerning cannabis legalization and decriminalization. I think, uh, certainly I look to my uh, organization to help the parliamentarians in Canada understand where to from here as it relates to this issue, <laughs> rather than to let the issue be defined by others who might have different interests. And finally, the public education. 
It's a very cluttered environment. It's bad enough and hard enough to describe cannabis for what it is, much less what the whole issue of medicine is introduced, which further complicates it. And I have to tell you, we are close to uh, for all our colleagues in the United States, much of the advertising that occurs there online on TV is imported to Canada, and that further complicates it. Or we benefit from some work that is done around the prevention that is very present online. Um, evidence and prevention, evidence-informed drug prevention efforts are effective, uh, and we need to remember that. Uh, we have reliable estimates of cannabis use, so we can track and measure the problem. Uh, we, there's an increasing understanding that cannabis is not a benign substance uh, by the general public, and we can really work at specializing our prevention and, prevent, uh, and treatment workforce um, through the standards and the work that we've done there. Um, so finally, the way forward is it more or less. We need to continue our monitoring and surveillance. Clearly, you can tell the researchers broke this, but it's true. Otherwise, we simply can't measure the problem. We have to continue improving cannabis prevention programs in schools and communities. Um, we need to evaluate the strength of diversified enforcement policies. You know, do we need a ticketing approach or not for cannabis? If, if in fact we stay with a non-ticketing approach and nobody's applying it, it's not that nobody's applying it, they are applying it. But they're not applying it in a way where you can see that there is a reaction among young people of concern of being caught. So what is it that we need to have in terms of uh, options there? Uh, we need to share our research and increase public awareness. So I think, um, let me be very clear, prevention works, and, and a lot of people say prevention doesn't work, but prevention does work, it's just not any sort of prevention, and we need to make sure that we really rely on the evidence to form that, that understanding of what does work. Treatment works, but again, not just any form of treatment. And one of the things that we've left Canadians with is this comment that was made, I think, at the very opening session, which is, we need to provide Canadians the confidence they deserve when faced with a drug problem, either themselves or their family that when they access the system, the system is actually composed of professionals, not people who are just quacks, that they are presenting programs that are based on evidence, and that they're accountable for the results. And that's not always the case in our country. So I think we need to sort of strive as a, as a nation towards that, and I thank you for your attention. And Michael for an excellent presentation and for a uh, very short of time, but I think a few questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just have a very little uh, geography question. Uh, did you observe the uh, difference in prevalence of the community? Ah, yeah. Did we uh, observe the difference in prevalence uh, changes within the regions of the country? They're generally consistent, although there are some variations uh, that track not unlike our alcohol consumption related issues. Uh, it's interesting that Quebec, which is our largest, uh, is our French province, uh, importing alcohol sales <coughs> now, has the highest reported level of consumption but the lowest reported level of harm. So you say, well, what does that mean exactly with respect to alcohol? On cannabis, uh, the numbers are much more generalized and, and consistent. What we do see, however, is with respect to many of our First Nations communities uh, and, and uh, some of our marginalized communities, far greater use. And if we start drilling, drilling down into uh, street involved youth, uh, so on and so forth, we see the numbers that's there. Hello. Hello, I'm from Brunei. Uh, I I'm very interested. How did you reach your, you mentioned about your strategy in one of the slides. How did you uh, get to that? I mean, did you uh, do a survey? Did you get consultation? Did you get, uh, you know, the youth to come in and give their views and so on? <coughs> How do you reach that? I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, it's the policy makers, the legislators who will uh, agree to you. But before that, what did you do? So the question being, how did we actually get to the momentum to create a prevention strategy across Canada? And this dates back a number of years where my organization sat down with, again, all the partners we work with, government, not-for-profit, and private sector, and we said, look, we were all concerned about alcohol and drug issues in the country. Do we agree to work together on it? And everybody said yes. Do we agree on what the priorities are? And everybody said yes, and what the top priority was alcohol. Uh, but among the priorities was the youth drug prevention strategy. So everybody agreed to it. We agreed that CCSA would lead the development of the strategy. We would bring together all the same partners and articulate how it is that we think we could deal with the issue. 
bring it to the respective levels of government for funding, and so that it's not always all roads lead to one government, but to many governments. And, and it's a lot easier, I think, for politicians and policymakers to agree when everybody's saying the same thing. So everybody was basically saying we need a prevention strategy. This is how it should be uh, structured, and this is how we should move ahead. And that's how we've been able to move it forward. That is the fact that we have a federal government who's prepared to step up and say, we want to do some prevention work, and here's how we think it should occur. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I also want to say, I'm from South Africa, and we do receive, or personally, I do receive uh, updates on the newsletter. And I think there's a lot of good work going on there. I like to, I don't know whether I can comment on cannabis psychosis, and perhaps a colleague from Denmark, Colorado. In sub Saharan Africa, we're not going to legalize cannabis. And even if uh, there will be consideration for medical use of cannabis, it will be a high schedule medication. It won't be prescribed by any ordinary, by ordinary medical doctor. It will be highly controlled, uh, unlike most probably in Colorado. We think it is a problem. Uh, I manage uh, uh, psychiatric wards at a public hospital. Most of the admissions of young people are problems of uh, accentuation of pre existing illnesses such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, by additional use of cannabis. But we also find very complex, difficult to treat psychosis where cannabis is mixed with uh, other substances such as methacolone and uh, <coughs> other amphetamines. And it gives you a very explosive presentation view. Suddenly, think there's a different types of schizophrenia that I, I've never seen. Within a few days, they've cleared off. When you test, you find that there are all these substances. So we don't have the resources, for instance, such as you have in, 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 in the USA or in Canada to continually test people. We do urine tests, we get mostly qualitative you know, uh, uh, results, not quantitative. And we, we, we definitely think it is a serious problem that we cannot really condone. It's a serious substance for us. A lot of young stars have been knocked out of school uh, because of cannabis. Well, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with you there. I think the point I just maybe leave us with the same amount of time is short is, as we take on these new programs, the question I often ask myself is, what harm are we trying to address? What problem are we trying to fix? Uh, if you look at the issue of prescription drugs in Canada, and in particular around opioids, the, the proposal that you make is highly controlled, very regulated, physician only. I can tell you we have a significant prescription drug problem in Canada as well. You have a series of people who are addicted because uh, uh, of the nature of the drug, and, and uh, there's no real understanding as to its uh, abuse potential. So at the end of the day, there's nothing very simple about all of this. I think they have to be regional solutions to regional needs. Uh, the issue of co-occurring disorders is, of course, very uh, important in terms of how to deal with young people and, in particular, cannabis uh, and other drugs. So uh, I, I'm sorry if it's not a very eloquent answer, other than to say that all of these elements have to come into consideration so that we understand what harm are we trying to address, what are we trying to achieve through our policy, what are the best means, who can be held accountable to it, and what is the evidence telling us? But I can tell you that the medical marijuana aspect in Canada is truly changing the nature of how we understand drugs for, 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 for approval processes. And, and what, what other drug is being used in this country that is uh, used in its natural form in a smoke form or less? Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to improve where we are. Um, but the current state of affairs is very challenging for many of us. Psychotic states. Psychotic states, do you want to speak to that, uh, Chris, I keep calling. John, Michael. Yes, I know. Chris. I know two. John, I know it. John Thurston and Michael Thurston. Now I know it's Chris. I'm sorry. The psychotic states is a really interesting question because partly because the first study associating um, adolescent exposure to marijuana and subsequent development of psychosis, meaning hallucinations, delusions, um, was a Swedish study that came out in 1989 of about 46,000 Swedish soldiers and looking at were they exposed to marijuana as adolescents, yes, no, and did they develop psychosis in young adulthood, yes and no, showing that the adolescent exposure confirmed about a four to six fold increased risk of developing psychosis in young adulthood. Since then, six other large cohort studies have been conducted showing about a two to four fold increased risk of developing psychosis in young adulthood with adolescents who are exposed to marijuana. 
those studies have controlled for over 60 variables now, looking at the possible confound of gender, um, family history of psychosis, using other substances, um, pre-existing psychosis, and still finding this relationship, and finding that it's dose, a dose-dependent relationship, meaning that the more marijuana someone's exposed to as an adolescent, the greater their likelihood of developing psychosis in young adulthood is, which is what we would expect if this were a causal relationship. Now, having said that, we will probably never know if this is a causal relationship because which parents here are going to volunteer their children, half of them to marijuana, half to placebo, and let's see who gets brain damage from it, right? I don't think many parents, and no, certainly no ethical review board would approve that study. Then there's the question of um, uh, pre-existing psychosis, such as schizophrenia, and co-occurring marijuana use. And we know that people with schizophrenia and co-occurring marijuana use have worse courses of their illness than those with just schizophrenia alone. They have more bouts of psychotic episodes and probably worse um, medication adherence for their schizophrenia. Um, and then we also know that those with a pre-existing vulnerability to developing schizophrenia, if they're exposed to marijuana in their adolescent years, they have an onset of schizophrenia about two years earlier than those who didn't use marijuana. And we know that age of onset, early age of onset of schizophrenia is a um, carries a poor prognosis in terms of the overall course of the illness. So we know that clearly there is this relationship between marijuana use and psychosis. And certainly about 15% of people who use marijuana report some acute psychosis with it. So there's, um, that goes away with, with when use is stopped. So we certainly know that this is an important relationship that needs further study. But you might also add that the concentration of THC has increased a lot uh, during the years, and that also increases the risk. And also, the decrease of CBD, cannabidio, which is so, uh, somewhat protected substance, has, has also uh, happened during the years. So the, 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 the marijuana uh, or, can, or the hashish that is smoked today is much more dangerous than it was uh, like 20 years ago. Okay, uh, I think maybe we have to uh, quit now because if we want to get some coffee before the plenary session. Well, thank you very much for your excellent